So um, the first thing to just quickly mention is a kind of like general proto. We work on concepts that sometimes have quite rhythm if they're especially kind of groundbreaking or trying some new feature that's not been tried before. Um, we that you look at anything with significant like, component and attempts to try that out in a small uh, version. No, necessarily will it all work. Um, here's a little video of Jack actually um, for a client project that we had. had um, a kind of creative uh, component of it, which we didn't know how it would look. Uh, he um, got the up and tried out without actually um, going too far down the line of the delivery. So it's really helpful for a client to be able to go and see that, uh, and for also for us, um, you know, when we are the clients, uh, and to see how um, close to the original vision that you can get that effect. Um, and that applies to any new features that are coming out, anything that's um, particularly complex or high detail, really worth just trying to make sure that you've tested that before um, going too far down the road. Um, a point on performance, um, so obviously with a lot of effects, um, there's a lot of things going on and it's very intensive on um, a mobile processor. Um, you should be using the native debugging tools within both Snapchat and Facebook. So um, to do that on Snapchat, when you submit or send a lend rather to your device to test, on the right you'll see a um, settings icon. And if you tap that, you'll be able to see the frame rate, um, the amount of RAM being used for your effect. Um, and it's really, really important to bear in mind that uh, older devices will not run the effect as well as your device, um, unless you are testing on an older device. Um, so you've always got to keep in mind the quality um, that will uh, that an effect will have when it's run on, on a slower device or one with um, less RAM or you know, a slower CPU. Um, so it's really important that um, you're looking to try and keep it as uh, consistent as possible because not only is it important to have a um, high frame rate but also one that is consistent. Um, so in the this is a snapchat on the left where you're seeing the FPS, FPS there. On the right you're seeing the Facebook uh, Spark AR debug um, player. You can just toggle on or off the FPS which you're seeing at the top there. So um, really important to take that into consideration when you're building your um, your lenses and effects um, and especially when it comes to then showing to clients often you know clients will have different devices to you they may well, may well experience issues that um, you didn't anticipate and so uh, make sure that you've if possible if you've got devices you can um, test on and do that uh, if you don't have access to lots of different devices then we'd recommend trying to kind of share with people that do have those um, devices, like friends or colleagues. So um, another really important point to um, think about when you're, ideally when you're building these lenses, but um, at, you know, at the, at the, towards the, the publishing kind of end of it, is to think about the UI hints. Um, within both Facebook and Snapchat, you have UI hints that will say things like you know, raise eyebrows or open your mouth to interact. Um, <clears throat> it's really important to take advantage of those because you're instructing the user how to actually use your um, the, the effect you've built. And so don't underestimate the power of that. They're very simple to add. You can also script them. And it's better to use native UI elements than to put your own text in. Um, the reason for that is that it'll, it'll appear in the right place on different devices. Um, if they also change the layout of um, of the UI, then that won't that text won't be obscured. They'll be adapted to different device sizes and so on. So it's important to make use of those as easily as you can. Um, and then when there are uh, complex uh, experiences or games, for example, um, you can think about including a full instruction set. Um, with uh, as you're seeing here, um, there's an instruction button left side of the interface for one of the games to be. Uh, and on the right hand side you're seeing a full set of instructions to the user so it's um when when there are complex interactions consider including a full <coughs> kind of set of instructions 
So when you're uploading an effect, whether it's Facebook or Snapchat, you'll need an icon to identify it. You need to make sure that the icon is appealing and compelling. So um, if you can get that designed early on, it's better to you know get out of the way. Um, then you can be consistent in using that icon. Um, and that, again, doesn't confuse the clients. Sometimes if they see the wrong icon or something that's you know, not branded correctly, that can just add an extra round of iteration that could have been avoided. Um, and it is something that needs to be recognizable and compelling to the, the user. And obviously, a lot of these brands have brand guidelines, um, which they need to incorporate. So the logo might have a certain amount of white space that needs around it. It might have a certain color scheme it requires. Um, and what we find is often providing a couple of variations just help because it means that the client can go and choose one that they like from a set rather than being given kind of free reign to then decide what they want to um, have the icon look, look like later. Um, and then on the video preview side, so with Snapchat, you're allowed to um, provide a video preview. Um, this appears in, for community lenses, it, it appears um, in the kind of discovery section of the, the lenses, which is when you swipe up on a, uh, in the, when you're using lenses. And those can also be searched for, so you need to provide keywords, um, which again, if, you know, if, if someone's created a football-based lens, then obviously you put the, the keywords football against it but you want to put in a few variants so that, again, you can maximize discoverability. Um, but as for that, the video preview will show there. So um, having a fun video preview encourages usage. Um, and I'll talk about it a bit later, but those video previews are also used for sponsored lenses in a slightly different um, way, a different context. But I'll come back to that when we talk about sponsored lenses. Um, so just on to testing, um, I would mention that the uh, effects that you're building um, will look very different depending on the device being used. So um, it's, this is a really uh, key point when it comes to trying to make sure you're maximizing for delivery on different devices. So on the left of these two screenshots, you've got a game um, that with, is within uh, an emulated iPhone X or iPhone 10 rather. Um, and on the right, you're seeing it on an iPhone 8. So the iPhone 10 has a, I think, 19.5 to 9 ratio, and the iPhone 8 has a 16.9 um, ratio. So the UI, the whole UI needs to adapt based on um, the proportions of the screen, and you need to make sure that certain screen elements aren't going to be covered up. So this is particularly important when it comes to sponsored lenses. The, um, with a sponsored lens, um, you have a button that appears just above the camera button, and you have a little sponsored tag that appears in the bottom right. So um, you need to avoid having, say, logos down there or any text appearing there because it will be um, hidden by this button. What we recommend doing um, is using a kind of fake button so that you can have that overlaid on your effect while you're developing it. And then you can just hide it and take it out when it's actually being um, finalized. So I'll, I'll just quickly show an example of this. On the right here, you're seeing the Install Now button with the sponsored text overlay. So again, you've got to avoid that area for any UI elements. And just coming back to the aspect ratio, obviously when you're thinking about phones that have, a, um, have less height to them than width, the, um, the elements will need to be positioned higher up. So if you look at this screenshot, for example, you're seeing that the tractor on the left sits a lot higher than the tractor on the right. Um, so it's really, really important to not only test on these emulators, which are within both Spark AR Studio and within Lens Studio. Um, if you don't know where they are, um, I will just show you quickly. So within uh, Lens Studio, if you go to the webcam mode, you can then see the different options for testing on different aspect ratios. So that, that has to be done using the webcam. So on Spark AR Studio, similarly at the top, there is the option to pick a, um, a device. So it's really important to um, not only use the emulator, but also then to test on actual devices, because the emulators are not 100% accurate. Um, again, if possible, try and ask friends to use this. 
um, colleagues with different devices. If you're able to have a few different devices in the office, then that's uh, or at home, wherever you're working, that's obviously um, a very useful thing to have, but equally cost um, does preclude that. Um, and then a final point really on the kind of uh, diversity side, um, in terms of your audience, you will often be building a lens or effect that you are testing on yourself if it's a face filter, um, or even if it's using a back camera with a certain uh, you know, uh, person that's, uh, that you're testing it on. Be mindful of um, differences in appearance, um, anything from gender skin tone to hairstyles, length and blur can make an uh, effect appear completely differently. And obviously with augmented reality, you're going to be finding that um, every different scenario um, can have a completely different result. So um, anything that's, you know, including um, based on the shape of someone's head um, or um, trying to, you know, in this case, for example, having a hat on top of someone's head, um, it's very different based on you know, things like glasses. Just, um, again, try and take that into consideration and hopefully this will reduce you or reduce the amount of feedback that would come back when other people test it. Um, and it, yeah, so it's just, it's just about trying to reduce the amount of feedback that you're going to have to contend with. Um, on the debugging front, we think it's a very, um, it'd be a very sensible route to while you're developing your effects, include the version number on the screen. So it means that someone who's testing it, if they send you a screenshot of something that's wrong, and you've been updating a certain effect like a number of times with different iterations, um, it can help reduce confusion when you see what version number they were using. So if they're using version 9, and you published you know, version 8 yesterday, version 9 today, and you're just about to publish another version, you can just see clearly which version was um, responsible for that issue. Uh, and always ask for screenshots or ideally you know, a video of um, an issue if someone is reporting that. Um, it's obviously very difficult to try and understand what's going on if you can't see someone's um, device. So them just saying you know, what, what the thing is might be missing because it's um, obviously you have a certain level of understanding about AR, but clients won't necessarily have that. Um, and just finally saying you know, it's not happening on my device or I can't see that it's not a helpful um, statement to a client. So to um, try and make sure that you're uh, asking the right questions to identify a problem is the best route. Um, it's, uh, yeah, then there are situations where people might be doing the wrong thing, but more often than not, they are experiencing something that you weren't aware of. So um, always worth trying to just get to the bottom of the problem. Um, so I just wanted to, on this whole sponsored lens thing, when we work with Snapchat uh, and clients who are publishing to Snapchat, um, they are predominantly using sponsored lenses. So there are two types of lenses for Snapchat. One is community lenses, the other is sponsored lenses. Uh, community lenses are the default uh, way in which you publish, where you just post, uh, you submit an effect and it will be reviewed and once it's reviewed, that goes live and you can share that via a snap code. With sponsored lenses, um, they need to be submitted. Well, first, you need to be given access to a, um, a company's account. So, for example, we work with King. Um, they need to give us access to their account to be able to send them lenses that we work on. Uh, and sponsored lenses are then trafficked uh, by being pushed into the carousel um, via three different types of um, purchases. Uh, and that means that they can apply a budget that will get them a guaranteed uh, amount of visibility. Um, and they, those types of um, purchases range from a complete buyout, which means that you are taking over Snapchat effectively within a territory and you'll appear in the very first position on the carousel to the right. Um, and another type is called reach and frequency, which is where you can, as a client, buy a certain uh, audience you want to target with a specified number of times in which the audience, the audience will see your lens. Um, and that will appear in the fourth position to the right uh, on the carousel, so not quite as prominent. Um, but the important thing with all these sponsored lenses is to make sure that the uh, areas that we've accounted for are, um, that we talked about the buttons and the sponsored lenses, um, uh, overlay rather, that those are visible. And you're not having items that are um, 
uh, going to be obscured by that text. So sponsored tags, um, really important to uh, make sure that you've got the positioning of everything correct. Um, and also just check when you're recording that uh, the behavior of um, different elements um, is as you expect, um, because there there can be differences in how uh, an effect appears when you're just you know viewing it versus when you're recording. That applies to both Snapchat and Facebook. So um, when you press the record button, if there are elements that are moving or resetting, then it's important to uh, make sure that that's been um, accounted for and, and tested. Um, so on the left here is just a little list of all the different call to actions that um, clients can choose to go in this install now button. Um, you can see the big range, but can be quite wide. So you can see like watch episode, for example, is a pretty long piece of tech, uh, wide piece of text. And that would go all the way across um, above the button, the camera button there. So um, when you're planning for um, a sponsored lens to have call to action visible, again, just account for enough space. Um, a little quick summary of publishing to um, the different platforms. So you're aware if you are publishing a Facebook AR effect to um, Facebook, there are two ways in which you can make a, a test link visible to a client. Um, so firstly, you need to pub export your effect from Spark AR Studio. So unlike Snapchat, you actually export a file that is then uploaded to a web platform. Uh, and that web platform is called Camera Effects. Um, so once you're uploading there, you need to either select that you're uploading the effect to your um, pay your personal profile rather, or to a uh, a business page. Um, if you push it to a profile, um, firstly you can set this as um, a draft. So in the bottom left is a bit of a hidden button, but that says save as draft. That means you don't need to go through the full publishing process in order to make that available. You get a test URL. The test URL can be used 200 times before it expires. But importantly, the test URL can only be seen by people who you are friends with. Um, so what we've done is we have a test page called Poplar Tests, where we um, ask our creators to upload their um, effects to. Um, and when you've uploaded a draft effect to a page, it can be viewed by anyone who's liked that page. But again, they need to have liked that page. So they'll get an error if they haven't liked the page. Um, so this means that you can basically upload an effect and test it without requiring to go through the whole review process, which is obviously very laborious when you're testing um, different iterations of an effect. So um, just bear in mind that profile and page um, uploads are the two ways that you can publish and that you need to either get people to be your friend or to like the page um, in order to view the test effect. Um, and in order to publish to a page, um, your personal Facebook account will need to have editor access or above. So that means editor or admin access to a page. Um, once you've uh, submitted your draft uh, effect, you can then um, publish it properly. Um, and, and during this process, you'll need to provide a video preview. You'll need to provide the geographies in which you want the effect to be vi visible. And um, again, that review process um, does take a while and we've seen it take anywhere from uh, a few hours up to maybe four or five days perhaps even longer so uh, when you are um, publishing an effect just be wary that it can take a long time for it to go through the review, review process uh, and then there's, there's some really key um, things to be aware of when updating effects which i'll come a bit come to a bit later um, separately publishing to snapchat uh, so uh, the process is slightly different. You actually publish from within Snapchat. Um, you can go to the button in the top left, uh, which will show you the lenses that you've submitted before. Um, you can either submit, as I said earlier, uh, a community lens. You can submit a sponsored lens. When you're submitting sponsored lenses, you will need to be given access to a business account. And within each business account, there are multiple ad accounts. Um, so, for example, a business uh, might be, um, like in, a, in our case, King, um, and an ad account might be uh, all the different, uh, well, one of the different games that they uh, that they produce. So, um, with the community lenses that you push out, um, you can 
just upload them by default. They go into your account um, and they're discoverable. So anyone could find them if they were looking for them. Um, but once you've published a community lens, it's available for one year from the moment of publishing. So it does expire, but it's a you know, fair while until it expires. With the sponsored lenses, um, there are two stages. So the community lenses, you submit it, it goes through review um, within, a, well, within a, within a day or so, and then it's live. Um, whereas with the sponsored lenses, they go to, through two separate review processes. Um, and when you, each time you've gone through a stage, you get access to a snap code that is live for one week. So if a client hasn't reviewed it in one week, then it's going to disable and you'll need to re-upload, which is quite annoying, but uh, that's the way it goes. And those review process can, processes can take up to five days in total. They've just changed the guidelines around that, um, which is a bit unfortunate. And it's a really long time to wait. But um, again, you've got to plan for that now, the five day period. Um, community lenses uh, have a video preview and description that you provide and keywords. Uh, again, optimizing those video previews means that people are more likely to go and play with them. So worth making a good video. Whereas for the sponsored lenses, the video previews appear actually in the ad account. So the client that you're producing an effect for will see the video that you upload in their ad account. And so you want to optimize for it to be identifiable uh, as much as possible. Whereas the community lenses, you're trying to optimize those videos to be as fun as possible. Um, and this is just what it looks like. So if you haven't seen this before, um, that's probably because you haven't got access to a sponsored lens account. So this screen on the left is what happens when you press publish an effect in Snapchat, um, but you've been given access to a sponsored lens account. If you don't have any sponsored lens accounts, then you just won't see the screen and it will go straight to submitting a community lens. Um, but if you were to click on the sponsored lens submission, you would see this interface on the right, which allows you to select, like I said, um, the business account and then the ad account that you want to submit into. And just be very careful that you need to um, select the right account. Uh, otherwise, you could end up going through a five day or so verification process um, and then realize that you've submitted to the wrong account. Um, so updating effects, uh, you uh, should really get the name of the effects sorted before you have even started any of this process. But um, if you haven't, uh, make sure that the name that you're um, going to submit an effect with does fall within the character limit. So there's a Snapchat character limit of somewhere around 15 or 20 characters. Um, and also on Facebook, it's just worth noting that we had a recent problem with uh, an effect that um, had uh, an issue with the the moderation filters. So um, it had a word that was rejected, basically. Um, and so we had to kind of change, adapt the, the title or the name of the effect um, to, to match. That name does appear in certain places. So just make sure that you've got your uh, the name of the effect cleared with um, with the client. Uh, they might have a certain uh, you know keyword they want to show in, in the name. So just make sure you've got that sorted. Um, and just be aware that in Snapchat, if you want to change the name of, of an effect, you have to basically resubmit it. Um, so yeah, really important to get that right. Uh, again, that could be another five day delay if you need to resubmit. Um, and in fact, with sponsored lenses, you can't update an effect once it's been finalized. So you'd need to resubmit fresh. So the client will end up with two different versions of the same lens, which could be confusing for them. Um, so make sure that you get that right. And then a really important point that we've learned recently to um, significant amount of pain is that when you are updating Facebook effects, um, the update can go through on the interface, but then the delivery of the effect itself can be cached. So what that means is that there's a copy, uh, say you submit version one of an effect, that's stored on Facebook servers, and whenever someone tries to load that effect, it delivers version one. Um, you then update it and upload a version two effect. Um, for a number of hours, um, maybe even days, the version one effect could still be served when you update it. So what we'd recommend is really just update it, not updating effects and just upload them as fresh and deactivate the old effect. Um, again, it's just, uh, even if you're making the smallest of changes, um, it can be very hard to determine whether you're, which effect you're serving, basically. So really watch out for that um, caching because it can really um, 
it can because it, it can be a very hard thing to diagnose because it means that with caching you might be accessing the effect uh, version two on your phone and wondering why the client isn't seeing that, but then they're accessing version one because they happen to have uh, accessed the cached version. So um, yeah, really worth just making sure that you um, up, don't update effects basically on Facebook. Um, so I just wanted to round off by talking a little bit about tech specs, um, what they are and what we look for, and some good examples uh, of um, good tech specs. Um, so concepting, um, as you might know, with Ad Poplar, what we generally the, the process we generally work in is that we request concepts from our creators uh, against a brief, and those of the from the concepts, the client will pick. Um, a, a smaller number to progress into full production. But before we go through into full production, we request tech specs to just outline uh, how an effect would be produced. So the concepts that we ask for are really the what of the idea, like what are you planning on building? And then the tech specs detail how that you would actually do that. And the reason that we ask for them is because we want to feel confident that the creators we work with are capable of delivering a high quality effect. Um, so the kind of things that we look for, uh, aside from examples of existing work that we can show the client to help them uh, feel more comfortable uh, about the quality, is to look at the um, the elements that will be included within the effect and try to get an understanding of where they would be sourced from, how they'd be created, um, and um, if that you know if if there's anything provided by the brand, for example, um, which in many cases there are a lot of assets that are given which uh, particular asset you would be using. So um, I'll just show a few examples of some good uh, technical specifications. So this is actually from the uh, tractor trouble effect that we, you've seen in a couple of the earlier um, slides. This is showcasing the textures that are going to be used. So these have literally come from the brand guidelines in this case. Um, and you know, before production's even started, it's very clear what the intended kind of um, output would be. Again, if there are textures that would be used that are from uh, materials that uh, or that are coming online or that you're designing yourself, just being able to see an idea or the aim of what's being um, uh, sought in the effect uh, is good. So if you are, you know, thinking of creating a wood surface or something, uh, a wooden table to appear on uh, on the ground just to see the kind of effect of, uh, or the type of wood that you would um, like to use. Doesn't have to be the exact texture, but an example is really helpful. Um, again, with 3D models. So in this case, there were links to um, Google Poly with the exact 3D model that could be looked around by the client if they wanted to. Um, and it's giving a, a, you know, a good sense of what the outcome will be for the client. Um, animations, if you can, uh, give a sense of how the effect will be animated if there are animations involved. Um, so for example, just being written here um, that the the wheels will be turning when it's moving forward, that they will bob up and down on the suspension. Um, that gives a really good indication that there is going to be a little bit of kind of movement. And so just having that written down is, um, again, help, helpful for the client to understand what the outcome will be. Um, if you've got Game mechanics here, um, at, if you've got a, a game that you're going to be uh, developing, showing the way in which users can uh, win points and uh, win the game or like uh, score higher, uh, again, provide uh, a kind of sense of whether you thought through all the, all the, uh, the, all, all the, what the, the mechanics of the game. And it will um, help the client feedback earlier about whether they would like something to be changed or whether they want it more challenging or less complex. Um, so doing the work early, again, means that you're saving time later on, hopefully. Um, this is a separate game, but again, um, what was useful about this is that you can see the intention um, with the interaction on the user's face. So we're seeing here that the, um, the user is able to sort of, cat, after they've cat, caught the, um, the candy in their mouth, they have their... Uh, their head affected by the the candies that are falling down, so it's um, again really clear to just pull something like this together um, before having to go and create the whole effect. And there was feedback that came that meant that we could adjust um, the display of these before they were fully produced. 
Um, music and sound effects, obviously, uh, are also really key to um, uh, an experience. And in fact, just you know, thinking about will you have background music and ambience um, to your effect? Um, and then will you have like sound effects that are going to be triggered at certain points? Where will they be sourced from? If they're coming from the, the clients, again, point out which ones you're going to be using. Uh, they might want to change them. And then just make sure that any assets you're using are either royalty free or that you've paid for. And again, if you can link to them as part of the tech spec, then that's um, hugely helpful to the client. So finally, it's just worth mentioning a few areas of assistance. Um, the popular Slack community that we run, um, we have a creator chat group there. Um, there's a lot of uh, other creators uh, and ourselves that you can ask questions to, um, and it's you know it's, it's worth being there just because there are people sharing lots of useful things from snippets of code that people have shared between each other to um, help with uh, you know just developing a, a small bit of functionality um, through to articles about AR and um, the, yeah and also the latest kind of briefs that we post. So there's a lot of different reasons why it's good to be on the popular Slack community, um, but specifically for Facebook. The Spark AR creator community um, is probably the, the go-to kind of place. Um, there are lots of um, useful things being shared there, but also the ability to ask questions um, and also mention bugs. Uh, so you can report bugs there. There are a couple of uh, Facebook employees who are uh, monitoring it. Um, you can submit bugs through the Spark AR studio, and I would recommend doing so. If you come across any bugs, just press, press the button in the top right which looks like a little bug, and describe the, the bug as you see it. Um, the downside of that is that you'd never get a, a response, so you don't get any follow-up as to what's actually, um, uh, what the progress has been in terms of resolving that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's worth not only uh, submitting a bug report through the studio, but also posting on it about it in the, um, the Facebook group. And then on the Snapchat side, um, there is a Snapchat Reddit group um, that's more often than not, people publishing their um, their lenses, but it, there is some support there as well. Um, and then separately, I don't think it's massively known about, but there is actually an official Snapchat support community, um, which is on this lens, lens, uh, Zendesk link. Um, so there, they've got forums where you can be asking questions, um, and uh, there are you know, announcements and so on, and community discussion about features, and there are again official. Um, Snap employees that are monitoring that, so that is probably the best way to um, to ask questions and you know uh, if you want a, a fairly rapid response on that. But again, we're more than happy to help um, where we can. Um, but we recommend putting questions out to the our own um, Slack community because uh, there are a lot of people who have done uh, great work for us uh, across both Snap and Facebook on there. So uh, that's everything that I wanted to talk through. Uh, and hopefully it's been useful. If there are any questions, again, feel free to just uh, let me know. Uh, if you think of anything after this, uh, you can feel free to uh, email me. My email is laurie at poplar.studio. Um, and uh, yeah, this video hopefully will be posted online so you can reference it later. But uh, if there are no further questions, then I'll let everyone get on with their evenings and uh, hope you have a good one.